Today, our guest on the Pocket Mastermind podcast is a CEO, writer, speaker, mentor, host of the 30 Minute Mentors podcast, joining me and Steve all the way from sunny Los Angeles, California, our first US guest, Adam Mendler. Welcome to the Pocket Mastermind podcast. Thanks guys for having me. Excited to be here. Oh, thank you very much for giving up your time. Like I say, you're our first our first US guest, so be honored. I'll try to represent the United States of America as best as I can. So let's talk a bit about you. Let's talk about where you are at the moment. So you're the CEO of uh, the Veloz Group. You know, when we spoke previously, uh, we touched on that you have a quite a broad portfolio of businesses that sit under sit under the group, um, from office furniture to custom cigars and uh, software, etc. So it'd be interesting to understand a little bit about how you ended up in with such a diversified kind of portfolio of businesses. Um, under you and then we'll talk a bit about your your background that really got you to where you are now my parent company is the Velos group we run a few different businesses we have a couple of different e-commerce companies under our umbrella one is an office furniture business called beverly hills chairs mm -hmm. we have a cigar company called custom tobacco we have a software development business called Velos solutions and i do a lot of writing and speaking so uh, in addition to my work as an entrepreneur, I've done a lot of writing in Forbes and Inc. and Huffington Post. I have an interview series in Ariana Huffington's platform, Thrive Global. And more recently, I started a podcast, 30 Minute Mentors, where I go one on one with the most successful people in the world on how they got to the top in 30 minutes. And it's, you know, a collection of founders. CEOs, former CEOs of household name companies and people who are household names themselves. So my goal really is to give listeners really practical, actionable advice that they could apply to their lives, to their careers. And I try to do it in a consumable way in 30 minutes. And um, I also do a lot of speaking. So I'm, I mean, not as much now that you can't really get out and you can't, you know, speak to audiences because there are no audiences, but yeah. pre-corona um, did a lot of speaking to businesses, to nonprofits, to uh, universities. I'm starting to do some virtual speaking. So I've gotten booked a couple of times for, for uh, online speaking events. So that's something that is kind of shifting a little bit. So do a lot of different things. Definitely keeps me busy, but um Excited to be here with you and with your audience. Always love talking about leadership and entrepreneurship and any audience that I can connect with is a great audience for me. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I could say you very, very diversified. I've got to say um, on your, your LinkedIn is probably the longest list of experience <laughs> I've ever seen of any other individual in my life. Uh, I've never had to click. Uh, see more <laughs> more times on anybody's profile I don't think so um, yeah you're, the list of the list of activities in and like I say in a in a very short space of time is, is extensive so that where did it all start for you how did you where, where what was the starting point out of, out of school college um, that really set you on this on this you know fairly diversified path a really, really good question. So I went to college in, uh, I'm going to have to be as uh, granular as possible because given that I'm your first American guest, or at least mm. your first guest based in the U.S., if I say that I went to USC, I don't know that that means a whole lot, but I went to college at the University of Southern California, which mm. is based in L.A., and I'm an L.A. native, and um, after graduating from USC, I moved to New York and worked for what was then the largest hedge fund in the world. So I worked for a company called D.E. Shaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, D.E. Shaw was my first job out of college. It was um, just a, a really good experience for me in that I got to experience what life was like outside of the fantasy world of being at a university. You know, going to USC was so much fun, four unbelievable years. And then when you graduate, you are thrown into the real world. And it's a bit of a shock because you're used to being the big man on campus and 
you get into a, a, a big company and all of a sudden you're the bottom person on the totem pole. And, you know, I wasn't delivering coffee, but I was delivering the financial equivalents of coffee. Mm -hmm. I was doing grunt work at this, you know, super successful uh, company with all these really smart, accomplished, talented people. So it, it was just a good experience for me. It was a humbling experience for me. I, I got to be around really capable people. Um, I, I just learned a lot being in that environment. After about two and a half years, uh, I left to go to business school. Mm -hmm. I got my MBA at UCLA, which um, is the other big school in LA. So in LA, there are, you know, sort of two major national universities, UCLA, USC. We also have Caltech, which is a great school. It's just smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I got my MBA at UCLA. And um, while I was at UCLA, I did a couple of internships in the entertainment industry. So I interned for William Morris Endeavor, which is a large talent agency. I interned for Universal Pictures, a large studio. And when I was graduating, I got a job offer to go back into finance and work for Credit Suisse. I took the job and worked for Credit Suisse uh, in their private banking group for about a year and a half. And I was 28, and it was really at that point in my life where it sort of struck me. I, I had, you know, worked for these two really large financial services firms, D.E. Shaw and Credit Suisse, one a big hedge fund, one a big bank. I had done these two internships at two huge entertainment companies. It sort of felt like I, I knew what life was like working for a big company, mm -hmm. knew what life was like in corporate America. And if I was ever going to try to do something more entrepreneurial, just felt like that was the right moment in my life to do it. My energy was never going to be higher. My expenses were never going to be lower. I was making good money, but I wasn't making the kind of money that I couldn't walk away from. Mm -hmm. You know, it was just sort of like, I, I didn't have golden handcuffs. It was just that, that right point to, to take that leap. Yeah. And I, took the leap and you know, was, I've just been at it ever since. What was missing? What was missing from, did, did you think there was something missing from your, from your life to, to turn away from employment? Was there something, was, was there a goal that you just felt like you weren't going to achieve? What was like, you know, the, the, the when you're 28 and you go, well, I'm going to do something else now. Yeah. Oh, was there a goal there? Steve, that's such a good question, and, and I thank you for asking it. And it's a, it's a question that I really hope all of your listeners are asking themselves because it's really important, no matter how old you are, to make sure that you're living your best life. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that in an idealistic sense. Mm -hmm. I say that in a realistic sense. We only have one life, and everyone needs to realize that if you're not happy in what you're doing, you need to take a step back and you need to really assess and evaluate what are you doing with your life? And I'm not here to tell you to quit your job and become an entrepreneur. And on the contrary, I've talked to quite a few um, of my former interns who were interested in pursuing an entrepreneurial journey. I talked them out of becoming entrepreneurs because I didn't think they were doing it for the right reasons. And I didn't think that they were at the right moment in their careers. And I, I didn't think they were just didn't think it was right for them to do it then and there. And my advice was don't do it or don't do it now. So I'm not necessarily the person who's always telling you go, go, go. But I do think it's an important question to ask yourself. Do I love what I'm doing? Am I happy with what I'm doing? Am I making a real contribution with what I'm doing? I, I felt like working in corporate America at least at that phase in my life, wasn't really taking me to a place where I was able to be my best self and where I was able to make the kind of impact on the world and just on people that I wanted to make. And I thought that being able to start my business, would my own business, would be an opportunity for me to really make a much bigger difference, a difference in the lives of others and just to make 
a, a greater positive difference overall. And, you know, I, something that I talk about a lot when I'm talking to audiences, if you find something that you love doing, if you find something that you're good at, and if you find something that makes a positive difference in the lives of others, you know you found it. If you can check off all three of those areas on the checklist, you're just going to keep going. It's not, it's not going to feel like work. It's not going to feel like a job. It's, it's going to feel like a hobby and more. And for me, that's this. That's, you know, I, I just love doing it. I wake up in the morning and I go to bed at night. And, and from the time I get up until the time I go to bed, I'm just fired up. I mean, I'm raring to go. And it could be working on one of my businesses. It could be giving a talk. It could be working on my podcast. It could be guesting on a podcast like this. I'm just amped up and juiced up and, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I love it because it, it's, it's just different. It's different than, you know, you're not punching a clock. You're not a cog in the machine. You're not, um, you, you know, you're not any of that stuff, but what you are is someone who is really helping people become their best selves, inspiring people to become their best selves. My work is really focused on, building and training better leaders, helping people become better, more effective, more capable leaders. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing that, it, you know, it, it's just rejuvenating in every aspect of what you do. Has, um, has it changed? Has it changed? So when you're 28 years old and um, you, have realized that you want to do something on your own and, and make a, make a difference. Has that actual goal changed? Because now obviously you've got the mentorship and now you want to, you want to bring on in, um, aspiring entrepreneurs. When you're 28, you probably, that probably wasn't the goal. So have you managed to, did you, is it, are you getting fulfillment after fulfillment after fulfillment? And then your goals change each time you become fulfilled with that, Goal? Yeah, your, your goals are always changing. Mm. I think it's important to um, always look forward, to always look ahead, um, not to feel like if you said you were going to do something at age 28 and you're 36 now, then you have to do it just because at age 28 you said you were going to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, my goal when I was seven years old was to run a baseball team. My goal when I was 18 years old was to run a baseball team. My goal when I was 22 years old was to run a baseball team. When I was in my mid-20s, I, I, I sort of changed goals and, and realized, you know what, as much as I love baseball, and, you know, that was my, my dream. And at a certain age, you kind of develop other dreams and develop other passions and develop other things that you want to do with your life. And when I was 28, my goal wasn't to start a podcast. Podcast didn't exist when I was 28. <laughs> but, you know, at, you're at a certain point, you start working on things and you develop new goals and new dreams. And look, anything is possible. It just, you know, follow your heart, follow your mind, set ambitious goals, focus on them, and don't let people who tell you no bother you just go and do it mm -hmm. if you care enough that? go make it happen what was the first step so you made that decision at 28 you know well I, the corporate america's not going to be for me long term entrepreneurship is what was that what was the what was that starting point what did you do from there yeah the starting point uh, another really good question the starting point was my brother was in a similar position. So my brother was working as a software developer for a startup company. And my brother wanted to um, do something totally different as well. And um, he and I just sort of stopped what we were doing and started working together and had this vision for the Velos Group, which is the company that we created. Mm -hmm. And we started working out of my apartment and we put together a Google Doc with all the different ideas that we had for potential businesses. 
And um, we populated that doc with probably, I don't know, who knows how many ideas. And we whittled it down to maybe 10 ideas and we just started pushing on them. And we spent our first year as a business really trying to take each of these different ideas and turn them into companies mm -hmm. without much success, by the way, because mm -hmm. when you try doing that, you're, you're and you lack the focus to, uh, you know, to just sort of take one idea or two ideas um, and drive on them. You kind of realize that it, you're, you're not getting a whole lot done. So after about a year, year and a half of doing that, we, we just kind of took a step back and said, Hey, wait a minute, we can't, build 10 businesses at once. That's just not possible. And we dialed it back and picked our two best ideas, not necessarily our best ideas, but our two ideas that were closest to monetization and just started pushing on those. But our first step was working together and, and um, sketching out the vision for the company. Um, I, I was very clear in those early days on what I wanted the Veloz group to look like, what core values were super important to me in terms of what the Veloz group would be all about, what our mission would be all about, what our culture would be all about, what our environment would be all about. And we spent a lot of time defining that. A lot of that stuff is still on our website all these years later. If you go to the Velos um, it, you'll, you'll see our mission and our vision. The stuff's still on there that we wrote in my apartment back in 2012. And that was just stuff that was from the heart. You know, we want this business to reflect our values. We want this business to reflect our belief in what really matters. And, Hopefully anyone who has worked for us, who works for us, who interacts with us, whether they're a customer, whether they're um, any sort of stakeholder can feel that. And um, it's something that I'm proud of. And how long did it take from that point then you kind of started to focus on the two, the two businesses or the two companies and then how long did it take to get things to moving and through and to, to a critical mass, I guess. And what point did you start to then bring people on board and what was, what, what was the next, what did the next couple of years look like? Yeah. So the first couple of years of our business, we had a ton of interns. When we um, started, I, I kind of had this vision for, bringing in lots of interns to help us with our business ideas. And that was inspired by my own experience interning. Mm -hmm. When I had interned um, early on in my career, it was such a rewarding, fulfilling experience for me. I learned so much. I developed tremendously. I grew a lot personally and professionally. And, um, you know, it was, it was just a, such an amazing uh, part of my journey that I wanted to make that a key part of the Velos experience. Mm -hmm. And we opened the doors to a ton of interns right away. So we started the business in March of 2012. And by May, we probably had more interns than, um, than GE had at the time. I mean, there were a lot of interns. So... Summer one, tons of interns. Um, we started hiring employees. Uh, by summer two, we had, I don't remember how many employees, but we had a handful of employees. We actually hired a couple of our former interns full-time as employees. I just feel so cool about um, having been a part of their journey. So that's just another rewarding part about being an entrepreneur and having, you know, had the opportunity to lead um, so many different amazing people. It must be incredibly satisfying to know that you've had that positive influence on, on so many people's lives who, who come through, particularly at that stage in, in their life, because it's very formative about how you then go on and, and develop and conduct yourself 
you know, in your in your business career after that point? It's one of my favorite parts of doing this. Where where did you go from from that point? Then is you started to grow the business. It's a it's a going concern. What was the what was the next step or growth phase that you needed to go through? You know, personally, but and, and as a business from that point. Well, we had to make money, and that was <laughs> that's that's kind of the that's always the challenge of it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the thing that that really matters, right? Basically, after a year and a half of burning through our savings, we reached this moment. It was a come to Jesus moment, which you know I'm Jewish, so for me to have a come to Jesus moment, <laughs> that's kind of a big deal. So, you know, so we had this come to Jesus moment, and you know, we realized, hey, wait a minute, if you're a cash flow business and the cash is flowing in the wrong direction, that's probably not a good thing. Mm-hmm. So, we were fortunately able to start running our businesses the way that we probably should have been running them from day one, and. Um, you know, that was the moment that we really turned things around. That was the moment that what did you do we started you? focusing on whipping these businesses into shape and turning Beverly Hills chairs into the kind of business that it's become today. I mean, it's obviously taken quite a bit of time to get here. It wasn't an overnight success. I don't think there is such a thing as an overnight success. It's taken us quite a bit of time to turn Beverly Hills chairs into the leading seller of refurbished brand name office chairs in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, That took quite a bit of time to go from, you know, our first customer who bought a chair from us uh, blasted us on Yelp. Um, Mm -hmm. Why did he blast us on Yelp? Because we fucked, I'm sorry, I don't know if I could use profanity. Because we screwed up up his order. I mean, he blasted us on Yelp because he deserves to blast us on Yelp. He totally screwed up his order. So, um, so yeah, that's why he blasted us on Yelp, deservedly so. I called him up and immediately apologized to him and said, hey, John, he was, he's the chancellor of a university. I got his phone number. I called him. I said, John, I'm, I'm Adam. I'm the CEO of Beverly Hills Chairs. First things first, I just want to call you and deeply apologize to you for messing up your order. Everything you said on your post on Yelp was 100% accurate. You had every right to rip into us. We completely screwed up your order. I want to give you a little bit of context. We're a new business. We're getting our act together. We screwed up. I'm so sorry. Um, here's what we're going to do to fix your order. We're going to send you the right order. We're still kind of working out operational kinks. You know, really, really sorry. He wound up, you know, switching it from one star to a five star. So it nice. felt good. Um, and, and now we, we legitimately run a five star business. So. To go from a one-star business to a five-star business takes a lot more than having someone, you know, call up unhappy customers and make them feel better. It requires actually being able to deliver super high-quality products on a consistent basis, which we've been able to do. So, um, you know, it's it's been quite a journey, but it's a, a journey that I wouldn't trade for anything. And humility, right? I think to be able to have that own own the situation and have that conversation in the first place not all businesses tend to do that they tend to try and justify um before trying to resolve and and i think that's an important lesson for anybody listening to what you just said there to be honest yeah when you screw up really good point david when you screw up own it i, I think way too many people have this um feeling that you know when you make a mistake you need to pretend like it never happened Mm -hmm. and you need to cover it up i have the complete opposite view my perspective is that mistakes are inevitable we're human beings if you're not making a mistake you're not trying hard enough everyone makes mistakes i make mistakes all day and all night Mm -hmm everyone's making a mistake. Look, if you're not, if you're not failing, you're not trying. So the important thing is number one, when you make a mistake, acknowledge it, recognize that you've made a mistake instead of pretending that it didn't happen. Number two, stay positive. Don't let the mistake crush you. Don't let that mistake destroy you. Don't let that mistake completely bring you down 
And number three, push forward. When my employees screw up, you know, what am I going to do? Am I, am I going to take a baseball bat and start swinging it at them? I mean, like, like what am I going to do as a leader? Am I, am I going to tell them to sit in a corner and put on a dunce hat? I mean, you made a mistake. So, so look, you feel bad about it. Don't do it again. Learn from it. Why did you make a mistake? What, what were the underlying reasons? You, you know, let's, let's turn it into a teachable moment and, you know, and, okay, stay positive. You're, there's a reason, there's a reason why you're working for the Velos group. It's because we believe in you. It's because you're good at what you do. If you're working for us, it's because you're obviously really, really good. So just kind of keep up the good work and, and own your mistake. Look, we, we screw up all the time. So with, when we, when we, um, with our customer facing businesses, when we make mistakes, we, we own them. And, and hopefully um, all entrepreneurs and anyone working customer service uh, should be doing the same thing. I love that. That's something I'm quite passionate about. Um, I think there's a culture and I don't know where it, where it originated from, or, but there's definitely, uh, you see it on the news, right? It's the question is who's to blame is the first, the first question that comes from reporters, uh, from news anchors, from, from anybody. And that subliminally goes through from generation to generation into school and and I think the the covering up of mistakes is part of that blame culture that we we need to try and eradicate and I think the best way to eradicate it is exactly what you just talked about there is by demonstrating a a more constructive and a more supportive way rather than finger pointing yeah I'm with you 110 percent you asked, and you you kind of touched on the uh, on a question I was going to ask you about failure, and you know, I, I I believe that you you can't do anything without without failing, and I'd be interested to get your your view on some of the failures that you've had along your journey and how you how you handled them and how you dealt with them. How much time do we have left in this uh, podcast? <laughs> pick pick some. Maybe maybe things. maybe we should. Um schedule a second podcast just yeah. to talk about all of my failures and maybe we should make that podcast like a week-long podcast, <laughs> a week -long podcast. Are there any are there any big ones that really stand out i know when uh, richard branson was interviewed and they said what was you know what's your biggest failure or biggest regret and he said virgin cola he was uh, arrogant and naive thinking that he could take on coca-cola and clearly it was never going to happen um, but he didn't realize that until after the event. Is there anything that, is there anything that really stands out for you on your journey that you think, um, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a sore moment, but what did you take from it? Well, I, I mentioned a big one, which was the, um, I don't know if you want to call it arrogance or if you want to call it naivete. I, I think it was probably more naivete, but maybe there was some arrogance in thinking that we could build out all these different businesses at once, mm -hmm. which turned out to be a huge failure. We basically spent our first year just kind of blowing time. We, um, you know, it's, it's, I'll, I'll frame it this way. People will look at you, you. You made a funny comment early on when you said, you took a look at my LinkedIn and you were like, Oh my God, you do this and you do that. Wow. It's the so list, cool. The list is long. <laughs> and people will oftentimes make that comment or a similar comment and say, wow, Adam, you know, how can I do what you did? How can I build these different businesses? And you know, you've built three different businesses and three different industries and how can I follow in your footsteps and how can I do that? And my best advice is don't, don't do what I did because what I did was a failure. What I did was a huge mistake. If I had to do it all over again, I would not have tried to start all these different businesses and all these different industries. I would have just picked one business, the best business, the one that had the highest probability of succeeding and just focused on that one. And, you know, a huge mistake of ours was spending that first year and a half um, 
you know, running in so many different directions that we wound up just running in place. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge lesson that I try to convey to entrepreneurs. Focus, focus, focus. Focus on your single best idea. Focus on your single best business. And focus on what you need to do each day to be successful. Set priorities, set goals, set long-term goals and set short-term goals. Because without focus and without the clarity of focus to really control your time as effectively as possible, you're not going to be able to be successful. Mm -hmm. And how do you go about, that's one question, you know, I, I definitely, <clears throat> and I speak to a lot of people, they go, oh, yeah, get, setting goals is all good and well, but I don't really know what my, <clears throat> I don't really know what my goals are. I don't know how to set goals, um, big goals, small goals. What's the, what process do you go through for setting yourself you know, goals. Do you set a long, a, a larger, long-term goal and break it down? And then, how do you measure your your own progress towards those goals? That's a good question. I think it's important to think of goal setting um, in both a short-term framework and a long-term framework. Mm -hmm. And I set goals. I set daily goals. Um, I set medium-term goals. And I, I set somewhat long-term goals, but I'm not, I'm actually not huge on long-term goal setting, which makes me unique. I know that mm -hmm. a lot of people who you probably interview are, are much more focused on, you know, set life goals, set 10 year goals, set 20 year goals. I, I was recently asked by someone, you know, like what's, what's your five to 10 year plan for Beverly Hills chairs and, and sort of like, for Beverly, I, I'm more focused on like what's our one to two year plan mm -hmm. because in five to 10 years, who really knows where we're going to be? Who knows where this market's going to be? Who knows where this industry is going to be? Five to 10 years ago, if I would have said to you that there's going to be this thing called coronavirus mm -hmm. that's going to force all of us to not leave our homes, to completely change the way that we work, completely change the way that we interact with our families, interact with our friends, uh, interact with every single aspect of our lives, you, you would think that I was, you know, on, on LSD or something, you know? So um, I try to think of, about it um, really more short and medium term. So that might differentiate this advice a little bit from some of the other guests who you interviewed. Um, short term, I try to um, prioritize goals um, based on number one, what is most important? And number two, what is most achievable? Mm -hmm. So every day I'm hammering out the things that um, are highest priority and most time sensitive. So if it's something that um, is urgent and extremely important, mm -hmm. it becomes a pressing goal for me that I need to get done today. Um, if it's something that, um, you know, is not so urgent, not so important, uh, okay, I can maybe get to it uh, if I have some time down the road. Mm -hmm. So the way that I structure it is, I have a to-do list every day that is really, really long. It's way too long for me to ever be able to finish. It's, it's truly a, a, a insurmountable list. It's a list that I'm never going to be able to finish. Um, but I try to knock off as much of the to-do list as I possibly can. And my to-do list only gets longer every day. The, the list just gets longer and longer. But what I'm doing is, I'm doing the things that are most important that day. And the priorities might change each day because, you know, a goal on uh, something on that list might not be that important on Monday, but by Thursday, it might be really important. Mm -hmm. So those things could range from, you know, scheduling a podcast interview to um, doing a call with my team to checking in on 
um, a certain uh, relationship that I'm pushing on for one of my businesses to you name it. So, you know, there are all kinds of things that I'm working on throughout the day. I mean, uh, I'm just going to, for, for our, uh, for our own amusement, I'm just looking at, at the to-do list today and it's, I can't even count it for you now. What do you use for all this? Did you use the, the classic notepad and pen or are you using digital tools? I actually use Google Calendar. So I use Google Calendar and um, what I do is I, um, I list things out. So I have my calendar um, where I schedule things throughout the day. So like this podcast conversation is scheduled and I have other appointments throughout the day that are scheduled. And then um, in the daily section of the calendar, I keep my running list of things to do. Mm -hmm. People to call, um, things I need to check in on my employees with, things I personally need to do. So that's how I manage it. Nice. I think that's a useful, useful tip because, again, another thing that I find with conversations with people is, trying to keep on top of to-do lists and where to keep it you know is it is it a notebook is it in one note is it in something and then there's always i think having uh, your take on on how you do could might be useful for somebody hopefully yeah and i i do believe that the more centralized your notes are the better mm -hmm. you know my my system isn't necessarily the best system for everyone mm -hmm. it might not be the best system for anyone other than me yeah. you know what there might actually be a better system for me out there that someone can show me. <laughs> but this works for me, and I think what's most important is that you find a system that works for you. Yeah, Adam, because I'm because um, I'm quite a nosy person, <laughs> hence why I do this. What what is your day? How long is your day? Do you do you work like till? Do you get up at like six a.m. and then work till midnight, or like what, what's your rules of, upon working? To say so you like you know. What's your chill out time and all that sort of thing? Yeah, good, good question, Steve. I tend to get up early, so I, I usually wake up uh, around, you know, it's actually more complicated than it sounds because I'll, I'll often wake up really, really early and then look at the clock and say, oh my God, this is way too early. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of will myself back to sleep because I know that if I get up at four in the morning or three thirty in the morning, I'm going to be shot by one or two o'clock in the afternoon. And so I'll, I'll just kind of like force myself to get back to bed and, you know, wake up then at six or a quarter to six and then get up and start my day. Um, so today I, I think I got up at maybe around six o'clock or quarter to six, which is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. And um, typical day I, I get up, I usually start off with, uh, email, checking the news, um, sort of responding to things that I need, I need to respond to. Uh, I'll eat breakfast. I, I enjoy getting a workout in in the morning, taking a shower, and then sort of diving back into the day. And I will typically work until I'm too tired to work. So sometimes that could be 7 o'clock. Last night was a lot later than that. Uh, last night, I, I worked pretty late into the night. Um, so it, it really just depends on how tired I am. I, I find that, that that moment changes every day because, you know, you, it, so, some days you're, you're just, by 6.30 or 7, you're just completely spent and you just want nothing more than to go home and yeah. turn on the TV and, you know, back when I could put on a baseball game, watch baseball. Now I'm going home and putting on Netflix. I, I need to find a new show. I just finished Waco, which was awesome. But, uh, you know, last night I um, had dinner, and then after dinner I went back and dove into my emails, and next thing you know it was like 11.30, and I'm like, yeah, you know what, I should probably go to sleep. So it just – Every day, every day varies. You will, so huh. the great thing about being an entrepreneur is that mm. there's no set schedule for you. I can tell you I've had my fair share of jobs that I, I can tell you at 8 a.m. I did this. At 9 a.m. I did that. 
at 11, I did this. At 2, I did this. At 4, and it was like, my God, I, who wants a life like that? Yeah. This is what I call freedom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so are you normally, you're normally in an office, and at the moment you're at home, I assume. I'm actually recording today from my office. So um, I've, during the quarantine, I've been splitting my time about half and half. Right from the office and from my place, we run an essential business. So Beverly Hills Chairs mm -hmm. is an essential business because we are um, providing chairs to lots of home offices. Right. So mm -hmm. that's become a huge part of what we do right now is furnishing the workspaces from people for people who are working from home mm -hmm. during this period. So as a result of that, it's an essential business. So, so I do come in um, probably two to three days a week, and I have recording equipment here in the office where I record my podcast. So, um, so I'm actually in the office right now, sitting on a Herman Miller chair right here. Nice. So, um, but it, it varies by the day. And do you find a difference when you're working at home versus working in the office? Um, you know, not having that punctuation of leaving to to make the journey home. I personally don't because I'm so focused and so in the zone. And, you know, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago that I started during this quarantine period. Um, now that I don't really have any other hobbies because my hobbies are, are all sort of banned by the government. I can't watch sports. I can't see my friends. I can't go on any dates. So I started uh, watching all these Netflix shows, mm -hmm. but, but I have, the discipline and I have the, the motivation and the drive to, to, you know, just focus on my work that I'm, I'm not even putting on any Netflix until I'm really too tired to finish working anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it's nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night and I'm then putting Netflix on. So um, it, to me, it doesn't even really matter if I'm working at home or working out of my office when it's work time, I'm working, I'm mm -hmm. in the zone, I'm focused. I think that's an important lesson is, you know, the, you, you're doing what needs to get done first and then, you know, using the, the time you have left to, as a wind down rather than kind of just filling, filling time. And I guess it's a bit like the time version of uh, investing the Warren Buffett mantra of, uh, you know, you spend what's left after you've saved and invested rather than the other way around. And, and I guess you're doing that with your time. Yeah, that's really how I look at it. It's an, and it's an interesting way of thinking about it. And anytime someone can compare me to Warren Buffett, um, I, I, I'm really comparing me to Warren Buffett. I mean, I don't, I don't know about that, but I'll take it. Sure. <laughs> Warren's, Warren's worth however many multiples. <laughs> yeah. he's. Uh, I can't even do the math. He's, of he's not doing too bad at the minute, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Warren, can, Warren can make, I, I would say probably, 10 bad investment decisions a day for the rest of his life. And it'll still be worth a lot more than I am. So yeah. He's doing okay. He's made a lot of good ones along the way. For sure. <laughs> yeah. What would you say your greatest life lessons have been? Hopefully I've uh, shared a few of them with mm. listeners so far, but I'll, I'll leave one with you um, in our remaining time and with your audience. I'm a very big believer to um, our, our, great hosts, the Bells, to our great listeners in the UK and around the world. Um, nothing personal, guys. I, I enjoy both of you. Hmm. Um, I'm sure your listeners are, are all good people. But I'm a very big believer that we're all bad at most things. Mm -hmm. I personally am bad at too many things to list. We don't have enough time in this episode for me to tell you how many things I'm bad at. In fact, if we started at the beginning of the episode, we still wouldn't have enough time <laughs> yeah. for me to tell you all the things that I'm bad at because I'm just bad at so many things. And the truth is, I don't know you guys that well. We kind of have been developing a bit of a relationship. We've connected a couple of times now and you both seem like great guys, but I'm sure you're both terrible at many things. Oh, many, many things. Yeah. But we're all good at a few things. Yeah. And if you take a step back and think about what it is that you're good at, probably come up with a couple of things on the list. But I believe very strongly 
that there's one thing in each of us. There's that one thing that every single person tuning in, every single person listening, doesn't matter what platform you're listening in on. There's that one thing that makes each of us special. It's our superpower. It's the thing that makes us unique. It's the thing that makes us different. It's the thing that makes us special. And the more quickly you can figure out what it is that makes you different, what it is that makes you unique, what it is that makes you special, the more successful you'll be in life, the more successful you'll be in business, and the more successful you'll be in as a leader. So I really implore anyone and everyone to take the time to figure out what it is that makes you special. Ask yourself, what is my superpower? Ask the people around you who know you best. Ask the people closest to you. What, it is, what is it about me that makes me unique? What is it about me that makes me different from everyone else you know, from all of our friends, from all of our neighbors? And it's that path of self-discovery. It's that journey. It's that process that really helps you discover who you are that is what this is all about. It's that step that I believe everyone should and needs to take. If you haven't taken it yet, take it today. No better time to do it than right now. Very wise words. And, uh, Thank you for that. Unfortunately, I think we are coming to the end of this incredible conversation. Hopefully we'll be able to do it again uh, in the not too distant future. I think there's plenty more questions that we, we would love to <laughs> ask you. We could do a whole nother show just on all of my mistakes and all of my failures and all the things I'm bad at. That, that would be a really fun <laughs> Adam, it's been an absolute pleasure and, and thank you very, very much for giving up your time. Before you leave, uh, where can where can people find you? Gentlemen, thank you again. This was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Hope anyone and everyone tuning in enjoyed it. Even half as much as I did. This was just so much fun. I try to make it really easy on listeners. It's just my name, Adam Mendler. So you can find me at adammendler.com. You can find me on social media at Adam Mendler. That's at Adam Mendler on Instagram, at Adam Mendler on Twitter. My show, 30 Minute Mentors, my podcast where I go one on one with the most successful people on how they got to the top and how listeners can as well in 30 minutes is all spelled out 30 Minute Mentors. You can find it at 30minutementors.com. You could find it at your favorite podcasting platform, whatever app you're listening to this podcast on, whether it's iTunes or Spotify or Google Play or Stitcher, you name it. And um, gentlemen, this was a pleasure. I just really enjoyed it. And thanks again for having me on. Thank you so oh, much. You're welcome. The pleasure was definitely ours. And I'd encourage people to have a listen to the podcast. It's brilliant. I listened to the, uh, the Rob Lowe episode earlier, which was great. That, was, that one was a lot of fun. I really uh, enjoyed having Rob on. He was really introspective, talking about his journey, talking about how he bounced back from some really hard times and mm. how listeners can learn from some of his mistakes and from some of the ways that he's been able to bounce back through the highs and lows of his personal and professional life. So that was a fun one. And it's just been an awesome experience for me and something that I've enjoyed having the privilege to share with listeners. Well, Adam, thank you very, very much.